Dr. Schultz, today we're going to talk about darolutamide. Recently, there's been an FDA update saying that it's now available for hormone-sensitive prostate cancer patients. So first of all, hormone-sensitive is not a super common term in our everyday language. So can you explain what that is? The default position of prostate cancer is hormone-sensitive. Would that there was such a remarkable therapy for all other cancers where you can give a medicine, a shot or a pill, and practically every single patient would respond dramatically with shrinkage and disappearance of their cancer. That's hormone therapy for prostate cancer. They contrast this with men that have been exposed to hormone treatment and uh, after a period, usually many years later, uh, the hormone treatment no longer is effective and that's hormone resistance or androgen resistance. The hormone sensitive uh, state of prostate cancer is pretty much where 99% of men with prostate cancer uh, are beginning at with a hormone-sensitive type of prostate cancer. Okay, so what is darolutamide? So darolutamide is a second-generation testosterone-blocking agent. So when we talk about hormone therapy, we're really talking about anti-hormone therapy. We're talking about blocking testosterone, uh, which is the, the male hormone that causes secondary male characteristics. And there are a variety of ways to go about doing that. You can give medicines to stop testicular production of testosterone. What we call second generation medicines are pills that block the synthesis of testosterone inside the cancer cell. This is a big discovery 10, 15 years ago that hormone resistant prostate cancer really isn't hormone resistant. What's happened is that the cancer cells over time have learned how to make their own testosterone rather scary proposition, but when they figured that out, uh, the, the brilliant biochemists designed medicines that can stop the synthesis of testosterone inside the cancer cell. And this completely revolutionized the way we manage prostate cancer. Uh, darolutamide is one of these second generation agents that um, can block the synthesis or, or block the activity of testosterone inside the cancer cell. So just to contextualize, you know, for first generation, am I correct that Lupron, Trellstar, uh, Orgovix are first generation and work in the, you know, former fashion you were talking about, and then we're talking about the second generation, which would be Lidarolutamide, Extandi, Zytiga, and such? The Orgovix and Lupron medicines block the production of testosterone in the testicles. So blood levels of testosterone um, will drop very low after starting Lupron and Trellstar and, and uh, Orgovix, uh, Firmagon, and, uh, and this type of first, what we call first generation hormone blockers. But uh, they do not uh, block the production or the activity of testosterone inside the cancer cell. So what are the side effects of a drug like darolutamide? I know with like first generation, we experience fatigue and a lot of you know other maybe rashes or things like that of that issue. Are those same issues going to happen in the darolutamide category? So most people that are taking darolutamide are already taking a first generation hormone blocker like Lupron or Firmagon, Orgovix, and the Additional side effects from adding the darolutamide are usually minimal to non-existent because side effects from losing testosterone have already occurred when, when, you, uh, when you take Lupron or Orgovix. Quite possibly, someone could be adding darolutamide, a second generation hormone treatment, to their uh, already initiated Lupron and not notice any additional side effects whatsoever. That's not to say there wouldn't be side effects if you took the darolutamide by itself, because when you block testosterone, uh, you're going to lose muscle, experience fatigue, hot flashes, loss of sex drive, um, and, and these sorts of well-known side effects. But if you're already having those side effects, the darolutamide quite possibly will not uh, cause any additional side effects. So I know for the sake of adhering to the drug, we often talk about side effect mitigation. So for fatigue, we've heard you talk about, you know, weightlifting and for hot flashes, I know there's certain estrogen patches. Um, do you see that those types of, you know, help to those side effects help with long-term uh, duration of taking the drug? Yes. Uh, so so all of the things that we do to mitigate side effects from, um, from Lupron or Orgovix are also going to be effective uh, for mitigating uh, side effects from darolutamide. It's just not common for people to be on darolutamide by itself. It's uh, Why is that? Would it work by itself? It might work quite nicely by itself, but the uh, clinical trials that were done to prove its efficacy, and in particular the reason this is on the radar right now is because the uh, 
There was a recent uh, study and FDA approval for expansion of darolutamide's indications into a, a group of men that have hormone-sensitive uh, prostate cancer that is already spread outside the prostate. And uh, this is a big deal, not because we didn't already know that darolutamide would work for this situation, but because darolutamide is an expensive medication, and now uh, the expectation is that we will be able to get insurance coverage for men that have hormone-sensitive metastatic disease. This category of men um, with hormone-sensitive metastatic disease uh, probably shouldn't exist. If men were all carefully doing PSA testing every year, you'd always find prostate cancer before it spreads. But unfortunately, there's still a lot of people that don't do PSA screening and show up at the doctor's office or at the emergency room with some pain or something like that, and they discover that they have prostate cancer that's already spread. And so for that category of, of men now, darolutamide is FDA approved and insurance coverage should be assured for those people. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's an important thing that we're making people aware of this because darolutamide is certainly an attractive product as you fit it into uh, the different um, other second generation medicines which it's competing with, uh, Zytiga, Erlita, and Extandi. The advantages of Zytiga, of course, is it's very inexpensive, but it's a little more cumbersome because you have to take cortisone with it and you have to monitor for liver problems. Extandi is an excellent medicine that has broad approval already. The uh, issue is that some people feel excess fatigue, and it's possible that darolutamide may have a lower incidence of fatigue. Erlita is another excellent second-generation uh, medication, uh, and we believe that all these medicines that, I, that I've enumerated, the Zytiga, Erlita, are uh, the... Uh, Extandi and the Darolita might have equal anti-cancer efficacy, so we don't think one works better. But the Erlita medication um, has occasionally been associated with some rashes, which is reversible if you stop the medication or reduce the dose. But uh, we haven't seen rash problems, and we don't see as much fatigue problems with uh, Darolutamide. So it's an attractive addition to our armamentarium. From that aspect, then, if somebody is on a different type of drug, maybe Zytiga or Leader or something like that, and they want to switch to darolutamide, do they just talk to their doctor about that? Yes, I think that the um, people that are already taking one of these other medicines and they're doing well, probably the hassle factor won't justify switching. But uh, for someone that uh, feels that they're having uh, a lot of problems with fatigue, for example, with Xtandi, they might find a better quality of life if they switched over to the darolutamide. So oftentimes in order to show that the treatment works, we pay attention to PSA decline. Is first of all PSA decline going to prove that the treatment is working? And if so, what does that look like over time? For hormone treatments and uh, chemo treatments, uh, the uh, what we call response to therapy is of course critical for for uh, justifying the ongoing use of the medicine. Uh, this is sort of a basic tenet, but it's interesting that I do see patients who um, are uh, consulting us who've had you know different types of treatment and uh, come to us with rising PSAs that have been uh, escalating over 6, 12, 18 months, and uh, it's oftentimes hard for me to figure out why hasn't some change in therapy been implemented. Uh, so it does seem sort of obvious that if the PSA is rising, it's time to rethink the treatment plan and consider some other alternative. So if you're taking darolutamide and your PSA is not declining, within what time frame should you think about switching from any of these uh, you know, treatments that you mentioned? I would say if you don't see a good PSA response within 60 to 90 days, you can be extremely confident that the treatment is not optimal and that you need to make a change. We've talked about intermittent hormone therapy a lot on this channel. Can you do intermittent hormone therapy with a drug like darolutamide? The studies validating the safety of stopping and starting Lupron, for example, first generation hormone treatments, are ironclad. And it's clearly safe to do intermittent therapy under appropriate supervision and in appropriately selected patients. And one does not need to fear that the, uh, they're going to either have shorter survival or the earlier onset of hormone resistance. That's, that's well established. I and others have been extrapolating from that Lupron intermittent data with the assumption that people that get good responses to second generation hormone therapies also could be at liberty to do intermittent treatment as well. There aren't any intermittent studies uh, that have specifically proven that to be the case. We've 
initiated intermittent therapy for people that are on second generation hormone treatments that have had good responses. Uh, and uh, so far, we haven't seen any evidence that we're running into trouble by doing intermittent therapy. So with darolutamide specifically, how long does it take for testosterone to recover? So darolutamide doesn't uh, lower testosterone. What it does is it stops the activity of testosterone at the level of the androgen receptor. If someone were using darolutamide as a single agent who's not already on Lupron or Orgovix or, or uh, Firmagon, uh, their uh, testosterone levels uh, will actually be higher. We saw this with a lot of the early um, uh, studies with Casadex. Casadex, think of Casadex as a very, very, very mild darolutamide. Uh, Casadex and darolutamide or Lita and Extandi don't lower testosterone levels. If you're giving them in the context of, uh, with a patient that isn't on Lupron, their testosterone levels will actually rise. So you can check in the blood and see that if the testosterone was two or 300 prior to Extandi or, or darolutamide, it'll go up to five or 600 while people are on the treatment. Yet, they're having all the side effects of low testosterone, hot flashes, loss of muscle, loss of sex drive. The reason is that is that the testosterone has been inactivated, it hasn't been eliminated. When you stop these medicines, Casadex, Erlita, Darolutamide, Extandi, the uh, return of testosterone is almost immediate. And so the long lingering uh, recovery periods that we see with Lupron and Firmagon are, are completely uh, not present. Thanks so much for watching. If you would like more information about prostate cancer and all sorts of education, you can visit our website, pcri.org, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We come out with new prostate cancer education videos every week.